So um, I'm going to outline uh, why oncofertility is important to us and important um, when in the patient comes into your office. I'll talk about the different options for fertility preservation. But more importantly, I'm going to also talk about a lot of things that we consider in survivorship of cancer or after um, chemotherapy radiation treatments. Um, and so uh, we'll go through these slides and you can interrupt me at any time with questions or we can save them for the end. So oncofertility emerged probably about 15 years ago um, that taking the uh, study of caring for cancer, but also the ability to have children after cancer and we put it together to balance life uh, preserving treatments with fertility preservation options. So <clears throat> we have seen a great advance in our cancer treatments um, and so we are seeing uh, improvements of life after cancer and really in the oncology world, survivorship, late effects of chemotherapy, all of those things are a huge focus. Um, and again, a lot of the treatments cause a lot of complications for patients after treatment. Um, and you know, genetic testing is um, becoming more common. People are also getting tested for BRCA mutations and other tests that um, people want to take their ovaries out or they want to um, uh, you know, undergo mastectomies. And so you know, counseling them as well about fertility preservation is important. So just some cancer statistics, about 11 million people are diagnosed with cancer annually. Um, 72,000 of those are adolescents and young adults. About 25% of women diagnosed with breast cancer are less than 45. 12,000 children are diagnosed with cancer each year. And in 2015, one in 250 people had survived cancer. So just looking at the treatments, chemotherapy, in particular alkylating agents, um, they target rapidly dividing cells. They can cause mutations in the DNA and causes oxidative damage. Um, our germ cells are rapidly, are always in cell division. Um, so our eggs kind of as women rest in the uh, meiosis diplotene stage. And so they're very, um, they're targets of this chemotherapy. Uh, radiation, the same thing, our tar can target dividing cells um, and can cause sterility. It can affect the uterus as well as the ovary, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, and the exact impact of chemotherapy agents, especially in like young adult women, is still uh, difficult to specifically say what's your risk because it depends on the patient's age, the type of chemotherapy, and um, the dose and or type of radiation. So we talk and I say oncofertility because I think that's become the catch-all term, but it's not limited to cancer patients because a lot of medical conditions will get oncological or gonadotoxic type treatments. So We've talked about cancer treatments, but also we see a lot more use of cytoxin in rheumatological disorders, lupus, we see it in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, multiple sclerosis patients are actually getting some of these treatments as well. Um, and then genetic mutations with, that cause pe um, premature or primary ovarian insufficiency. So we're thinking of Turner syndrome here. Could there be treatment for fertility preservation in that population? Um, and then we're also talking about BRCA patients that electively decide to um, remove their ovaries. And then bone marrow transplant for um, hematologic diseases such as um, beta thalassemia, things like that. So I'm just gonna kind of go through a little bit of the consequences that we think about. So, you know, the, the main kind of function is our hypothalamic ovarian axis, and as a reproductive endocrinologist, this is like my favorite thing in the world. Um, so the treatments can be very different, um, and you know, for brain tumors, we'd have to think about uh, radiation. They may also get chemotherapy. Um, the ovaries are particularly uh, susceptible to any type of pelvic radiation, total body irradiation, as well as um, chemotherapy. And then the uterus is mainly affected by photon radiation um, that uh, directly targets the uterus or kind of pelvis area. So just going through the different types of tumors, so hypothalamic um, pituitary tumors are often treated with cranial radiation and can often cause neuroendocrine dysfunction. The frequency of disturbance can range from 50 to 80% when you look at the, the various literature. So it really depends on the radiation fields. And our radiation oncologists have gotten awesome that they can tell you the fields and they can tell you how likely it is that their pituitary hypothalamus is gonna be affected. And so that's important because a lot of patients that get cranial radiation, although they don't have 
ovarian um, dysfunction afterwards uh, because they didn't get any chemo, they may have hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction, and so they may need hormone replacement treatment. If they're young girls, they may need pubertal induction. So um, it's just important to know those. The most common growth uh, effect on the hypothalamic dysfunction after radiation is growth hormone, and then it's the gonadotropins, as say the thyroid and the adrenal, because they're a little bit more important for overall body processes, or tend to be spared and fail last. The other effect is our ovarian follicle pool. So we as women are born with all of our eggs at the beginning of life, which most people do not know. I, whenever I counsel, they're like, really? So I think it's important to educate our patients that we don't make more eggs as women. Um, they are in our ovaries, and once we reach a critical uh, exhaustion of our ovarian uh, follicle pool, uh, we will see infertility, menopause, symptoms like that. And then the uterus. Um, pelvic radiation can lead to uterine damage, reduced uterine size, abscess of endometrial thickening, and reduced or absence of uterine blood flow. And this is a really tough um, one to treat because you will have, um, or I guess to counsel patients, we get the risk of, if it's less than four gray to the uterus, so a lot of times that could be spinal radiation, things like that, then they say it's likely fine Then your pregnancy wouldn't be compromised. Over 25 gray, they say, or 25 to 40, they say you really shouldn't attempt pregnancy. But that's a very wide range from four up to 40 gray of radiation. And so how do you counsel those patients? And so a lot of times I do send them to maternal fetal medicine or to their OBGYN for preconception counseling. So they're at risk of preterm labor, preterm delivery, as well as placental problems, all from radiation. So it's just something to be aware of if someone comes in your office and has questions like, oh, I had radiation as a child, where was it? You know, those type of things. And all of that information can often be um, obtained. So we use a risk assessment, and um, this is uh, essentially low, less than 20%, intermediate, 20 to 80%, and then high, greater than 80%. In pediatrics, we have a lot more data and uh, um, girls are often at the same place in their ovarian follicle pool. So we can be a little more specific in pediatric. In young adults, it depends on what their pretreatment ovarian reserve looked like. So if you have less eggs going in, you are gonna often be more affected. And age matters as we get older. And so again, I take a chemotherapy plan. I look at, there's lots of resources to get risk assessments. And this should be something that your reproductive endocrinologist can do um, to know, uh, to be able to counsel the patient or even the oncologist. This is part of the oncology guidelines now, is to provide this risk assessment and offer referral for fertility preservation. So essentially this says infertility on here, but really uh, we wanna know the risk of primary ovarian insufficiency because if someone has POI, then they won't have an opportunity after treatment to have genetic children. And so the big risks are gonna be the alkylating agents we talked about, whole body pelvic radiation, bone marrow transplant, those are very toxic chemotherapies, same with stem cell transplant, and surgical um, sterilization. So for any type of ovarian, sometimes uterine cancers, um, as well as um, patients that undergo prophylactic BSO for BRCA mutations. Um, those would all be patients obviously at very high risk of POI, and so we have to counsel them about their fertility. So not gonna go through this in detail, but this is often the scale that I'll look at. I'll take a chemo dose, I'll look at this and tell them what their risk is. There are some chemotherapies that really don't have any risk or un a lot that have unknown risk. There's new chemos coming out, a lot of immunomodulators that come out now to treat, treat uh, diseases, and we just don't have a lot of data on those. So looking at um, this here, it just talks about the different um, treatments and the potential outcomes. So we've talked a little bit about loss of follicle reserve, um, but also the ovarian hormone dysfunction. So if they do get diagnosed with POI, they're going to need hormone replacement therapy, premature menopause, um, abnormal uh, cycles, uterine dysfunction, um, failed pregnancy, and then infertility. But a lot of this can lead to other outcomes. So they often can get depression, loss of identity or attractiveness, psychological disorders, a lot of sexual dysfunction that occurs after treatment of cancer, 
um, and issues with their sexuality. So a lot of this, if we talk to patients about the risk beforehand, um, I do think it improves their survivorship care. And this kind of sums that up, is that women who receive inadequate counseling report increased negativity, increased psychological distress, and a decreased quality of life after treatment. And many female cancer survivors say that the fact that they cannot have genetic children is their primary concern after treatment. So now I'm just gonna get in a little bit to the options. I'm not gonna go in super in-depth detail, but just to kind of give you kind of some updates of where we are with these treatments. So the standard of care treatments, egg freezing and embryo freezing are both considered standard of care. Neither one are experimental. They removed the egg freezing experimental label in 2012. Ovarian tissue cryopreservation is a experimental procedure, typically for prepubertal girls, but often can also be used for girls are women that don't have time to freeze eggs um, prior to their treatment. So oocyte and embryo cryopreservation, as I said, they're standard of care. It involves controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, which takes typically about 12 to 14 days. It could take longer, um, up to 20 days. So that's a big consideration that we have to get is the, the quicker they can get to me, even if it's before they've seen their oncologist or their surgeon, um, the sooner I can at least say, hey, this is our timeline and I can get everything lined up to start them as quickly as possible. Um, and so we get multiple mature um, oocytes and then we retrieve them through a vaginal um, needle uh, under ultrasound guidance. So again, we just have to make sure patients are stable to undergo these procedures. So if you remember from IVF kind of treatments, it's not without risk. There's risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome um, procedural risks, they are very minimal, um, and we monitor our patients closely to avoid those risks, but uh, you know, I need someone that maybe has leukemia, their blood count is low or they have low platelets, I need to make sure they're stable to undergo these procedures. So typical IVF starts in the earlier follicular phase or coming off a birth control pill, and that's probably what a lot of people kind of remember, and that's where <clears throat> a lot of times women would say, I don't have time to do this. I started my period a week ago, so now I have to wait three weeks to my next period, then two weeks until they um, complete the process. That's no longer true. I only showed two types of starts here, but I can start a patient at any time within two to three days. Typical cycle takes about 11 to 10 day, or 10 to 11 days to um, stimulate, and then two additional days to retrieve the egg. So usually within 14 days, most patients are done. If they don't occur at the typical time, so if I do a luteal phase start, um, they may take a little bit longer, one or two days, but it's not that two weeks or three weeks. So oncologists are really happy about this, that I can go a lot faster than I used to. And they don't seem to compromise the outcome of um, retrieving the eggs. So we seem to get the same number of eggs, the same number of embryos, those type of things. So just kind of as a, um, Reminder here, we do the egg retrieval with ultrasound guidance. We then will take the cumulus from around the eggs um, up here at the top, and that's stripped. We identify mature eggs, and then if they are fertilizing embryos with a partner and there's any issue that we need to do, um, inject the sperm into the egg, that's done that same day, and then they're cryopreserved. And then typically we send these off to long-term storage facilities. A lot of questions you guys may have about costs. I think that's one of the, one of the most biggest barriers. Um, the actual storage costs, there's lots of long-term storage facilities around the country that if they're getting any gonadotoxic treatment or chemotherapy, they can get the storage for like $75 a year. So we send ours off to Indianapolis because that's great. Um, the price of the egg freezing, um, a lot of centers will reduce that price. We have development funds at our institution to help patients out. So there's a lot of resources out there. Um, because this can be costly and it's often still not covered by um, insurance. So just some special just concerns. Um, some people uh, get concerned that this may delay surgery. This is just a study that looked at women that chose eggs versus to freeze eggs or embryos versus those just moved right into their breast cancer treatment. And they found that there was really no significant difference in time from diagnosis to definitive surgery, definitive um, operation to chemotherapy or from their cancer diagnosis to starting their chemotherapy. So again, we get it done pretty quickly and we work around, I had a lady undergit her mastectomy while she was in stimulation and we just brought her over from the hospital to do her monitoring and then put her back for recovery. So we work with our oncologist to not 
decrease or increase any time in their care. Um, success rates, the, there's some um, data that egg freezing can be as equivalent to um, embryo freezing. And so they, most eggs, 90% will survive when we thaw them. About 80% will fertilize. 40% will make it to the embryo stage where we implant them. And it's about a five to four to five percent, um, up to 12% pregnancy rate per egg. So that's just based on patient age um, and the quality. I think the rates are getting better. We used to only say about five to 7%. Now we're saying up to 10 to 12%, especially in our younger patients. Um, embryo cryopreservation is um, the standard of care. I mean, I think we know have longer data. Embryos always have thawed better than oocytes. Um, and so the pregnancy rate um, with live birth and less than 35 is still about 35% in the country with embryos. Um, so again, our technologies are improving, um, I think every day, and I think each lab, the more egg freezing you do, the better it gets. Um, so that's a concern for patients, but I think egg freezing often is my recommendation. Unfortunately, cancer treatment <clears throat> does put stress on relationships, and we've seen in different areas of the country that there can be legal battles amongst embryos. And so if you're, even if you're married, you may get divorced, and if you froze everything, it's an embryo. If your husband at the time won't let you use that egg or that embryo, you don't have any you know, other gametes. And so I often recommend at least freezing some portion as eggs alone so that the patient has their own genetic material that is not linked to somebody else. So one of the questions we get are the rates same in cancer patients. Um, and so there's limited data, but it's starting, we're getting more and more as we continue to do this. Uh, women that, are, that have cancer often need longer times to stimulate and often more medications. Um, they also can be canceled more than women without cancer because we don't see them respond there. Just sometimes we almost see like a, acute ovarian, I wouldn't say failure, but essentially acute ovarian uh, dysfunction where just the body does not want to respond because the body is fighting so hard to work against the cancer. So that's just something I always counsel the patients about. There is a higher rate of poor response, so less than four eggs retrieved. As you saw, the pregnancy rate per egg is not super high, so it still is a chance of maybe 30 to 40 percent if you got four eggs, but I ideally like to get more than 10 to give a good, reasonable chance for pregnancy. But I will freeze whatever comes out uh, when we do the egg harvest. Um, and the next thing I was going to talk about is the experimental ovarian tissue cryopreservation. So just a little background, this is a procedure where we uh, remove ovarian cortex, it's harvested, and the cortex is um, cryopreserved. Um, as I said, it's often offered to prepubertal girls because prepubertal girls cannot undergo egg or embryo freezing. They don't have the HPO axis developed enough to have the eggs respond to gonadotropins. Um, the surgery can perform rapidly and doesn't delay medical treatment. So a lot of times when we do this patient, this in patients, that are pediatric or at the pediatric hospital, it's done with their central line or if they're getting a bone marrow aspirate or some other procedure, we'll just put this on at the same time. Um, and again, the next, after we remove that tissue, um, we look up here, this is just an oophorectomy that is done. And then the tissue is dissected in the lab and it's cut into little strips in that Petri dish. And then we see that later on, we can transplant that tissue back into the body. And so this is um, it, uh, it's typically done and it can show uh, once the patient is ready for pregnancy because the function of the graft is only about two to five years. There's been over 150 clinical pregnancies and live births and over uh, 60 to 90% of patients that have the ovarian graft will show ovarian hormone function after the graft is put back in. So typically the graft is placed back in the ovarian fossa or it can be sewn on the contralateral ovary that was not removed. Um, so in the ovarian fossa, they just make like a window in the peritoneum where the ovarian fossa is and they just drop the strips in, seal it up with a little like flow seal or glue and then that's it. And it can actually undergo um, natural, if the tube is left in place, the tube can actually pick up that egg or patients can undergo IVF. So this is just, um, they, the, what is the live birth rate for this? I think this is a big question. I think this is why this still has an experimental label. 
Um, so within the last few years, in 2017, they did a meta-analysis that looked at all of the ovarian transplantations. And um, they found that in 309 uh, um, ovarian transplantations um, in 255 patients, um, they 400, 250 of them essentially were done for fertility preser uh, restoration. Nine was to um, uh, restore endocrine function. And so they had eight articles with a denominator. So essentially how many patients actually underwent this so we can get a clinical pregnancy rate. And so what they found was that the cumulative live and ongoing pregnancy rate was about 37%, so about 40%. Um, so oftentimes patients will undergo the process multiple times if they want multiple children. So you often don't always transplant all the tissue at once. So the fertility preservation rate was about 30%, and the endocrine function rate was about 60%. And so um, it's becoming, I think, less experimental, especially in our post-pubertal girls, um, because we have this data. And you know, there is a call out there in our literature to remove the experimental label from this. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about GnRH agonist treatment. Um, so there is some data that GnRH agonist treatment in breast cancer patients can decrease rates of amenorrhea. We can't, there's no data that shows that that will decrease fertility. Um, no one's looked at that, I think, because it's a difficult long-term follow-up. Some women choose not to have children after their pregnancy. So amenorrhea is what they looked at, and they did say that GnRH agonist did decrease your risk of amenorrhea. So a lot of times in our breast cancer patients, we will use this. Um, however, in other cancers, it has not been shown to improve fertility or amenorrhea rates. So it's typically just limited to breast cancer patients. Um, GnRH agonists can often be used though for menstrual suppression. So if they have leukemia, lymphoma, a lot of times treatments can cause platelet dysfunction, anemia. So it's still a good option for menstrual dis, uh, suppression during treatment, um, but I don't typically use it for fertility preservation except for in breast cancer patients. And I always typically recommend having it with something else if they have time to egg or embryo freeze because they're at risk for, for infertility, um, I will do that as well. And so this was a paper that showed that um, this was a meta-analysis that did not show that there was a benefit. But then right after that one came out, gosarelin, um, which is similar to Lupron, um, same medication, uh, just a different formulation, they showed that it did cause ovarian protection for amenorrhea. And so um, the recommendation from um, ASCO is that there is some conflicting data uh, but that it should be, it can be recommended in breast cancer patients, um, but it should not be the only fertility preservation option offered to patients. So I wanna focus a little bit more now on reproductive considerations after treatment. So ideally fertility preservation options should be done before treatment begins. So ideally we wanna preserve eggs, embryos, um, do ovarian tissue before treatment begins. But there is, in some patients, some potential to complete this in survivorship. I always tell the patients I can't guarantee it, though. So I recommend before treatment, but there's a lot of, patient, a lot of places that don't have the infrastructure available to do all of this counseling ahead of time, so they may not have known their options. So the biggest barrier is why do people not do it, the lack of time. Some people are just so worried about delaying their treatment by two weeks or even three weeks to do egg or embryo freezing that they just can't consider doing this and they will wait. Um, financial barriers, this is the highest one. Is that 90% said that financial or lack of insurance coverage. There are a few states now that have gotten mandate, mandation for fertility preservation. Rhode Island was the most recent that got that preserved. Um, I'm from the state of Ohio. We tried to work to get this done, and there's a lot of different medical or, I guess, ethical um, concerns that go into this, um, and so it's difficult to often get this covered. Patients are often overwhelmed by their diagnosis and their options. Um, they have like six appointments that week to get their MRI and get their PET scan and all this other stuff, and then they're in my office, and I have to give a lot of information in a really short period of time, and they just are overwhelmed. Um, one thing I think that's helpful with that is who's ever making the diagnosis of cancer 
starting that conversation of, you should find out if these treatments affect your fertility, we can get you to see a specialist if you want to do that. Um, and so I often like the, the referral to come with the referral to the surgeon or with the referral to the oncologist. And then I will always work with my oncologist to make sure that they are comfortable with these procedures and would never go. I always actually have a medical clearance form that the oncologist has to fill out before we go forward. Um, but the other concern was lack of counseling. So 50% um, were counseled that they may um, not have periods, um, but they didn't often correlate that to fertility. Um, in males, only about 50% were offered sperm banking. And then they found other factors. So educational level, if you had a higher educational level, you often were counseled, maybe because the patient asked about it. Um, if they already had children, they often weren't counseled. Um, because they thought, oh, we already have kids, but maybe they wanted a big family. So I think um, it's just understanding um, that we should offer this to everybody. And then the last one is insurance status. So patients that had insurance were more likely to get this counseling. So what does comprehensive care look like in survivorship? So fertility monitoring, um, oftentimes patients may come in and say, how likely now that my treatment's done and will I have infertility in the future? Um, fertility preservation, could I still preserve something I didn't do it before? Hormone replacement therapy is often needed. Um, contraception and pregnancy. Um, there are some gynecological, gynecologic concerns that can happen in survivorship. And then um, sexual dysfunction is often common in survivorship as well. So there is no single test to predict fertility. Um, I know there's lots of data out there on AMH or anti-mullerian hormone. Um, there was a great paper done by Ann Steiner at, um, she's now at Duke, but she was at UNC at the time, where she essentially found that AMH, if you weren't trying to get pregnant, is not predictive of fertility, and this was in women that were above 30. So AMH um, cannot predict fertility, neither can FSH or estrogen. Um, serum hormone levels and menstrual cycle monitoring can be helpful. Um, to look to see if patients have ovarian dysfunction after treatment. And so um, abnormal levels plus menstrual dysfunction, I have a strong concern for primary ovarian insufficiency. Um, so for that, I don't tell patients that the fertility monitoring is really useful until at least 18 months after treatment. We can even see recovery of ovarian function up to two years. Um, I've heard stories of survivors getting um, egg function recovery five or six years after treatment. So I think part of it is looking at their symptoms and their, their labs and making the best decision for does this patient have a you know, compromise of fertility? Do they need hormone replacement? So I do check an AMH and FSH and estradiol at the 18 months to see what their ovarian function looks like. Um, and then I just counsel the patient. Most of the time, the AMH is useful over time because the one thing about women that's different than men is after we have our chemotherapy, um, our, even though you may have ovarian function, you're still for the rest of your life at risk of premature ovarian ins or primary ovarian insufficiency earlier than the age of 40. And so I think it's often just counseling patients that we can monitor this, but a single value is not predictive. And so trending these over time is kind of what I counsel patients on. And if they don't want that information, it's just sometimes it's too stressful, then we don't do it. So it's just really counseling the patients on what their options are. But you may see, I get a lot of referrals. You may see people coming in and wanting their AMH checked. And then it's, you know, if you feel comfortable uh, checking it, then I think that's great. But if not, then you should refer them to a reproductive endocrinologist um, to do that testing. Um, so just looking at the impact of um, uh, ovarian insufficiency, osteoporosis is the big one, heart disease, um, if they're young, lack of pubertal development, infertility. Um, so fertility monitoring also allows for making the diagnosis of POI and initiating HRT. So um, different formulations of estradiol and progesterone so in young women, they have done some studies and they recommend for even hypothalamic amenorrhea, but POI in young women, that the estradiol patch is most effective for bone protection. So my favorite option for HRT in these patients are, is the estradiol patch with a levonorgestrel IUD, um, because then I also am giving them contraception. 
Um, so even though they are POI, there's still some data that they could have eggs in the back of the ovary, and if they're not wanting to get pregnant at that time, we don't want them to get pregnant. If they are interested in pregnancy, then often I will put them on the lowest dose of the patch and then have them do cyclic progest progestin withdrawal bleeds so that they aren't using any contraception at that point if it's safe for them to get pregnant. And then progestins can also be used daily. Not everybody likes the patch. Some people have problems with skin. So, you know, estradiol is also an option if they just want to take a birth control pill, that is good. I do just counsel them that, in theory, the patch is more effective for bone protection. So for those, I don't find that girls are as compliant with the creams and that we get enough of estrogen dose from the creams and the spray to actually give bone protection. So the minimum that you need for a bone protection is a milligram of estrace, so that's oral, and that's equivalent to a 0 0.05 patch, um, which is equivalent to if you did use birth control pills like the low, low estrogen or the 10 microgram pill, those are all equivalent. That's the minimum you need to get bone protection with the creams and the sprays. You don't get that minimum. So if we diagnose POI, this is also a time that we can start counseling them on third-party reproduction. So donor egg, if it's male, donor sperm, gestational carriers, embryo adoption is a new thing. A lot of people have embryos that are left over after completing their families. They used to just sit in storage tanks. Um, when we moved our IVF lab, there was a lot of abandoned embryos. Um, and so now patients are trying not to have those. And our goal as reproductive endocrinologists is giving them those options. And so there's a lot of embryo adoption agencies out there. Why I bring this up, it's a lot less expensive than third-party reproduction. But I like to bring this conversation up early because everything's expensive. Adoption, everyone's like, oh, I'll just adopt. Adoption is not easy. Adoption is a very difficult process. It also can be as expensive as third-party reproduction or more expensive. Um, adoption agencies are often not cancer-friendly, so it's also, it's also important to find a, a survivorship cancer-friendly adoption agency, which I provide a list to my patients. So I think it's just counseling patients if they didn't preserve fertility, still giving them that support that there is ways to be a mom, because there's lots of different ways to be a mom. Um, cancer and pregnancy, how long should they wait? I always defer this question to their oncologist. There is no standard of care. Most of the time I get about two years is recommendation. Um, there seems to be no increased risk of congenital anomalies in the offspring. So that's in patients that did not preserve fertility that got pregnant afterwards. Um, we don't seem to, with assisted reproductive technology, there is a slight increased risk of congenital anomalies. Um, we quote somewhere about one to 2%. So if they did freeze, it's important to talk to them about that. Um, for if they had pelvic radiation, you know, preterm birth, uh, low birth weight, all has to be discussed. Um, and um, for patients with breast cancer, even hormone positive ones, they actually seem that pregnancy may be somewhat protective. So it doesn't, um, there's no guidelines. It's working with the oncologist to know when it's safe. Um, some women, if they have a hormone sensitive breast cancer are on tamoxifen. The new tamoxifen recommendations go up to 10 years after treatment. Some breast cancer um, specialists or oncologists will let them take a break. They'll do like the two years of treatment and then they'll take a break for pregnancy and then they can resume it afterwards. It all depends on the severity of their disease, how things look afterwards, but I think it's important to um, have your patient advocate. If pregnancy is super important to them, bringing these tough dis questions up to their oncologist early so that their expectations are set. So contraception, and I put this in the survivorship, but it's also super important um, during treatment, really important during treatment. Um, and so it's a conversation to have with your patient as you're referring them out for their oncology care. Or you may get a referral from the oncologist of this patient needs contraception. Um, so the most common ones I use are the IUD. I often just place them at the time of my egg retrieval. Um, and that just depends on their cancer. Obviously, if they have a hormone sensitive cancer, um, like breast cancer, if it's estrogen and progesterone positive, I typically they have to use barrier methods. Um, which is not as ideal, or they could use a copper IUD. So a lot of times our breast cancer patients will get a copper IUD placed at that time. Um, 
And so always counseling them for condom use because during chemotherapy and, um, uh, or just some kind of barrier method um, that they are at higher risk of getting infections. Um, and so using that, if they are able to take hormone uh, birth control pills, that's still an option. Most oncologists don't let us use estrogen because the chemotherapy and the cancer already puts them at higher risk of um, VTE. So I typically never allowed to use um, birth control pills, but I use a lot of Depo, I use IDs. Um, if they're okay with an implant, we can use the next one on. So it's just having that conversation with patients. Um, and then these are just a, a unique GYN issue that I did not realize until I went to the pediatric hospital. So graft versus host disease is an inflammatory reaction to donor lymphocytes from like bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant. Um, there's different forms. There's acute and there's chronic GVHD. Um, vulvovaginal GVHD is a chronic form. The incidence is pretty unknown. Um, it can range from three to 49%. Um, typically within the first year after transplant is when we see the start of GVHD. And most women have extra genitals, so it's usually on the vulva. I'm gonna show you some pictures here. So just a little um, background for it. Uh, symptoms can be dryness, itching, pain, so pain with sex, um, tampon insertion, postcoital bleeding. Exam findings are often erythema, pain, fissures, um, adhesions, um, sclerotic changes of the uh, vaginal mucosa. Um, they can also get synechiae or adhesions within the vaginal canal. And so this, they actually have a scoring um, for this. And if you look at the picture here on the left of the screen, so grade one, you'll just see some areas of redness, um, a lot, typically around the introitus is where we notice this. Um, there can be generalized redness, um, patchy versions of it. Um, when we get to grade two here, we start to see erosion of the mucosal surfaces of the vulva, and we'll start to see fissures in the folds, um, especially near like the labia minora and the labia majora. And then grade three, we see severe agglutination. We can often see complete um, uh, loss of clitoral hood um, pathology or uh, anatomy. You can see introidal stenosis, vaginal sneaky eye, um, young girls, I unfortunately just took a young girl to the OR, I'd put her on um, estrogen, me and my partners had put her on estrogen patches, and she um, started having this pelvic pain, and we went in and got an ultrasound, and she had complete uh, hematocolpus and um, blood within the uterus, because she had vaginal stenosis right at the level of the introitus. Another young girl that I just took, she has a complete adhesion over her cervix. I looked before I put her on the estrogen so that I knew what would happen. Um, and so this is just something that may be seen. So if patients come into the office and they're complaining of these symptoms, sometimes it'll be urinary dysfunction, things like that. It's important to do the exam and know that it could be there. Um, oftentimes we treat it with the same topicals that are on the skin. That some type of um, steroid cream is often put on the skin for graft versus host disease, and we'll use the same ones. So you can kind of use the same treatments as like lichen sclerosis and things like that. Um, I will say clobetazole seems to be a little bit more um, potent um, and irritating to this. And so we do try to start with either a lower strength of the cl like clobetazole or um, using a different steroid cream initially. Um, sexual dysfunction is a big issue. Um, so it can result from physical, psychological, emotional issues resulting from their cancer treatment. Um, I, I always like to try to understand, and I don't always get it at their initial visit, but when they come back in survivorship, I always ask, how is your sex life before you had cancer? Because a lot of times it was a great sex life and now it's not so good. And so sometimes it's understanding the expectation of what the patient has. If she wants to get back to the sex life she had before, what are the issues are, that are barring that? Does she, you know, and I think there are other lectures on sexual dysfunction, but is it a desire issue? Does she feel, you know, she doesn't have hair now? She has um, pain with intercourse. And so there are lots of different things to talk about. A lot of times we all refer for psychological and couples therapy if it seems to be an issue. Um, sometimes if uh, they've had a mastectomy, man, her husband's no longer as attracted <coughs> to her. Um, and so those are um, issues that come up. And then medical management, pelvic floor physical therapy, a lot of times those can often be helpful. Um, so just to kind of summarize the important role for the gynecologist or the primary care physician that's seeing this patient is you can refer fertility preservation counseling because every, most 
reproductive endocrinologists are going to work with their oncologists to make sure this is safe. Also talking about and opening that door for contraception management during and after treatment, managing um, ovarian failure, sexual dysfunction, and then pregnancy management after treatment. There's lots of resources out there. Um, there's Fertile Hope that gives free medications. So pretty much any patient with cancer, um, unless they make an ungodly amount of money, gets free medications through Fertile Hope. Um, and so that can save them five to $7,000. Um, and it's just sent to the fertility clinic. Um, this is a really great app put out by Northwestern. It's Save My Fertility. Patients can download it, ask lots of questions. Um, stupidcancer.org gives resources for patients to help do fertility preservations. And there's lots of grants out there patients can apply for. So we do try to find resources to help overcome the financial burden of this. So conclusions that all reproductive age patients um, should receive, that are receiving chemo radiation should be offered fertility counseling. Um, Fertility counseling can also focus on other things other than just preserving, and so that's going to be their risk of POI, sexual dysfunction, infertility, and you know uh, issues with um, graft versus host if that's a concern.